Hello there. I'm Margaret Marsh, but call me Peggy. All my friends do. Uh, what was I doing? Oh, well, I'm responding to some fan mail. I get about 300 letters a day, and I try to respond to all serious inquiries. I've always been writing, really. I began making up stories before I could even write. I told them to my mother, and she would write them down for me. Later, I would make my own books with cardboard covers and build them with adventure stories using my friends, relatives, and myself for characters. When I got a little older, I switched to writing down my stories in copy books. I liked writing a great deal, but I never really liked school. It was my mother who saw great value in education. She also saw great value in myself being a proper Southern lady. So I attended the Washington Seminary, a prestigious finishing school for young ladies in Atlanta. It was a fine school. I didn't mind it much, but when America entered the Great War, we got a bit of excitement. A seminary girls were in demand at dances that were being thrown for the young servicemen stationed at Camp Gordon and Fort McPherson. It was at one of those dances in the summer of 1918 that I met Clifford Henry. He was from an old New York family. I know, I know. I fell in love with a Yankee. My family gave me all sorts of grief about it, but it was mostly all in good fun. I didn't know Yankees could be so handsome. I had always heard stories about them being mean or ugly, but Clifford wasn't mean. He definitely wasn't ugly. He had signed up to fight for democracy and was a bayonet instructor at Camp Gordon. We had a whirlwind of a romance that summer and, well, became engaged shortly before he was shipped overseas. We were both on our way to new places then, and new adventures too. He went to France and I went to Smith College in Massachusetts. Mother was absolutely in love with the idea of her daughter attending one of the best colleges for women in the country. Smith College is a private liberal arts woman's college in Northampton. It was started back in the 70s, and it's one of the Southern Sister Colleges. They were created to provide women with the educational equivalent to the traditionally male Ivy League colleges. My mother was a Southern lady, no doubt about that. But she also held some rather progressive views. She believed that women should go to college. So I went. She wanted me to be one of the foremost lady doctors in the country. She said women needed to study practical things like math and science so that they could support themselves and careers and be independent. Well, she probably raised me to be a little too independent. And I hated the North. Their speech hurt my ears. There's no melody to their talk. Everybody's always rushing here or there, and there's just no time to sit a spell. I felt like a stranger in a foreign country up north. I wasn't doing well in my classes either. I was only good at English. My mother's hope for me being a doctor were dashed, and I was all around rather ill-contented. It was also there where I received some of the worst news I've ever gotten. That September, Henry was wounded in action. He repeatedly advanced in front of the platoon that he was commanding, drawing machine gun fire so that the German's nest could be located and wiped out by his men. He was wounded in the leg for this effort. 
but his death came a month later from the shrapnel wounds he'd got when a German plane dropped a bomb over his head. He was awarded the French Croix de Guerre for his actions of heroism, and the president presented him with the Distinguished Service Cross and Oak Leaf Cluster. He was a hero, no doubt. He fought gallantly and he died bravely. You know, I still send his parents flowers each year on the anniversary of his death. The next year took my mother from me too. There was an epidemic of Spanish flu that had come through. Again, I was at college when I was sent word that mother was stricken with influenza. I took the next tram home to Atlanta, but I didn't make it in time. My brother, Stevens, was waiting at the station for me with the news. Mother did leave me a letter, though, that she had written before she passed. It said, Dear Margaret, I expect to see you again, but if I do not, I must warn you of a mistake a young woman of your temperament might fall into. It was all about duty and what I should and should not do. Nothing about love. I just wanted her to be proud of me, but I guess she never was. I was in mourning for my mother and quite sick as well, but father made me go back and finish that year at Smith College, even though I did not want to. I wrote to my brother, Steve, that there was no use keeping on at college because there were so many more talented girls than I there. and. If I can't be first, I'd rather be nothing. But after finishing out the year at Smith, I returned to Atlanta to keep house for my father and brother. I was to make a debut and be a debutante. Well, I got bored with my domestic duties and the Atlanta social scene. I felt like a dynamo going to waste. So I decided to create some fun and caused quite a scandal doing it. I performed a risque dance with Tom Holland, who was attending the University of Georgia at the time. We made our dancing debut at a local debutante ball. It was a French dance called the Apache. It involved him throwing me around quite a bit. I crawled on the floor for at one part, and then there was another part where I pretended to slap him. Oh, it was the talk of the town for weeks. Met the papers and got me blackballed from membership in the junior league. Everyone said I would never be a debutante now, but debut? Poo poo. It struck me funny that I should shake a shimmy as a deb, for I had no matrimonial aspirations. I organized a group called the Rebel Debutantes. I even got interviewed by the paper. I told them that marriage is not essential to salvation. That women are coming down off the auction block and going to work. I wanted to be a writer. And at that time, I thought about writing comedies and short stories. Something to make people smile. My brother was worried, though, that I had created a bad reputation for myself and that no one was going to marry me. <laughs> but it didn't hurt my marriage chances any. I still had men who wanted to date me. And in 1922, I got married to Baron Epshaw, but everyone called him Red. Red didn't have a job or come from money, so we moved back in with my family. And, well, my father wasn't exactly happy about that. But I didn't really think that's how married life would be either. Red was down on his luck and wasn't finding work, so... I thought about getting a job. Of course, my father didn't like that one bit. Married women were not supposed to work outside the home in his eyes. At least, that is, if you wanted to keep a respectable place in society. Well, I don't care much for respectable society, and I fast talked my way into a job writing for the Atlanta Journal Sunday Magazine. I had no newspaper experience. And I had never had my hands on a typewriter. But I swore I was a speed demon on a Remington and got the job. I used my maiden name as my byline. 
All the stories are published in the paper by Peggy Mitchell. Red disappeared a couple months after I started working. But he showed up again. He was penniless and angry and... Our marriage had always been a disaster, but I had it annulled. A couple of years later, I got remarried to John Marsh. Funny enough, he had been Red's best man at our first wedding. Well, now I finally got the groom right and was standing in the right place this time. <laughs> now, I'm not all the one that he thinks I am, but I've succeeded pretty well in keeping him fooled. And if I can just keep him that way the rest of our lives, I think we'll be very happy. We live in this tiny apartment I sometimes affectionately call the dump. John works for Georgia Power, and I continued to work at the newspaper until my anger went bad again for no apparent reason. It's an old injury I got from horseback riding. It was this incident in my childhood, but I was on crutches, and I couldn't go out on the beat like I used to as a reporter. So I quit my job. I was so bored being at home all day while John was at work. But John being a dear would bring me home on loads of books from the library for me to read and keep me occupied. Well, one day my husband came home and told me that I had read every book in the library. And if I wanted anything else to read, then I would need to write my own story. So I did. But what was I going to write about? Well, I started writing a tale of the jazz age, of, of flappers and bootleggers doing the Charleston to big band music. But, well, it just didn't feel right. I abandoned that one, and I went in search of another story. That's when I remembered an event from my childhood. I was young, and I didn't want to go to school. Like I said, I didn't like school much, and I hated arithmetic, and I saw no value at all in education. Oh, and this made my mother so mad. She had always been one to value education. So she scooped me up and plopped me down in the carriage. And then Mother drove me down the roads towards Jonesboro and showed me the ruins of houses where fine and wealthy people had once lived. Plantations that had been burned by Sherman during the Battle of Atlanta almost half a century ago. She said their world had exploded beneath them. And she told me that my own world would explode under me one day. And that you better have something that you can hold on to. That you better have something within you to survive and make it through this life. You've got to have gumption, courage, resourcefulness. And I had my story. I began writing my book from back to front. That is, I wrote the last chapter first, and then I worked my way towards the front. <laughs> After I finished each chapter, I stick it in a big manila envelope, and then I put it somewhere in our tiny apartment. I decided to set my story in my native state of Georgia at the beginning of the Civil War. My people have always lived in the South, most of them in Georgia, and the tales that they have told me got woven into my story. In my childhood, I had sat on the bony knees of Confederate veterans on the fat, slick laps of great aunts who had survived the war and Reconstruction. I heard how Grandpa Mitchell walked nearly 50 miles after the Battle of Sharpsburg with his skull cracked in two places by a bullet. I must confess something, though. I was 10 years old before I realized the South had lost the war and that it had ended 35 years before I was born. The way people talk about it, you would have thought it ended yesterday. I also thought that it was the time for my state, Georgia, to have some recognition. Whenever there's a book about the Civil War, it's always set in Virginia. 
My main character came to life on the pages as Pansy O'Hara, a spoiled and strong-willed coquette who comes of age just as her family's life on a cotton plantation is ravaged by the war. I didn't tell anyone that I was writing a story. When friends stopped by to see me, I was through a tea towel over the typewriter so that they couldn't see what I was working on. Only John knew. And he was my reader and my editor. I finished the novel in 29, but it was far from complete. I worked on it sporadically for the next several years. It seems to be quite frank, pretty lousy, and I never really bothered to try to sell it. The way it got published was something of an accident. It was the spring of uh, 35, and an executive of Macmillan Publishing was coming to Atlanta on a book scouting tour. Uh, Harold Latham was his name, and he had heard about me and my rumors of a book from a friend. But I denied those rumors, and I told him I didn't even have a book. I didn't know how to write. But I, I didn't want to talk to him. But he was so persistent. So I admitted that I could write and that I was working on a book, but it was not ready to be seen. Latham then let me be and was getting ready to leave Atlanta. I was telling a friend about this, about Latham and how he was so insistent and, well, I, I admitted that I was writing a book. And then she said that she couldn't believe that I would have written a book, that I was not serious enough to write a book. So I got mad and I rushed home and I rounded up all the manuscript that I could lay my hands on. Remember, I, I stuck them in, in envelopes all around the apartment. They were not in any type of order. And later I realized that I had forgotten all about the envelopes under the bed and the ones that were in the pots and pans closet. So it was an incomplete book, but there were still so many envelopes. <laughs> and I didn't think that it would get published or anything. My idea was that at least I could brag that I had been refused by the very best publisher. So I went and I gave all the envelopes of my novel, or, well, all the ones I could find, <laughs> to Latham. And he had to go and buy another suitcase just to hold them all on his trip back. But the next day, I had changed my mind. But Latham had already gone on a train leaving Atlanta. So I sent him a telegram, and it said, send it back. I've changed my mind. Oh, but Latham did not send it back. He had already started reading it on the train, and he couldn't put it down. So my novel was going to get published. I spent a couple months revising and rewriting. I cut and I rearranged chapters, and I, I wrote the first chapter all over again. The story came easy, but trying to figure out how to start it was hard. I also changed the name of the main character from Pansy to Scarlet, because some thought Pansy wasn't a strong enough name. But through it all, there was one section that I didn't change. Scarlet's return to Terra after the Battle of Atlanta. I also went back and I checked facts. I really wanted to make sure that my novel was historically accurate. I spent years reading thousands of books and documents, letters, diaries, old newspapers, to make sure that I got my book historically sound. I also conducted interviews with people who had lived through the war. I even had gone horseback riding with Confederate veterans to confirm details over battlefields. Finding the title for this book was also difficult. I considered many titles, including Tomorrow Was Another Day, Another day, tote the weary road, milestones, Baba black sheep, not in our stars, the bugle sang true. 
but I finally settled on a phrase from a favorite poem of mine, Gone with the Wind. It was published on June 30th, 1936 to rave reviews. Millions of copies sold in just the first six months. God knows that I didn't expect it to sell like this. I think the nation that was going through the worst of the depression really saw themselves in Scarlett's struggle to survive after her world had exploded around her. Because if the novel has a theme, it has to be that of survival. That qualities, what qualities are in those who survive that are lacking in those who go under? I only know that survivors used to call that quality gumption. So I wrote about people who had gumption and those who didn't. When I was young, I had wanted to be famous in some way. Artist, writer, soldier, prize fighter, anything for the thrills. But I left town three days after I was published. I had lost 10 pounds at an alarmingly short time. I felt dreadfully. I wept when the phone rang. And it rang every five minutes. I found out that I was not cut out to be a celebrity. And I didn't like it one bit. But people were just crazy about this book. It won a Pulitzer Prize, and now David O. Selznick wants to make a motion picture out of it. Well, I've gone on long enough. Everyone knows my book is long. But do y'all have any questions? Well, um, Miss Mitchell, can you talk to us about, uh, when you were growing up, uh, can you talk to us about the kind of family status that you had? Were you a fairly privileged child or family? Or were you in the poorer parts of society? Where did you land? Well, I landed somewhere near the top, I must say. Luckily for me, my family had had it rough through the war and reconstruction, but had come up the ladders of Atlanta society pretty well. We weren't the richest, but we weren't poor by any means. And we were an old family. My people have always been in the South, so people knew, especially they knew my mother. My mother had come from a very, very well-to-do, well-respected family. And she had also gone to that school. I went to the Washington Seminary. So everyone who goes there knows each other and each other's children, grandchildren, and all that. So they're well connected in Atlanta society was my family. And you mentioned that you had gone through extensive measures to make your book historically accurate. Was there any uh, part of your research that really surprised you about um, the Southern experience in the Civil War? Maybe experiences that you definitely wanted to include in Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't say anything surprised me. I had grown up with these stories and people telling me about the war. Like I said, I thought the war had ended right before I was born. And, well, I guess you could say I was surprised the South lost. The way everyone talks about it is that they won. But that didn't work. That didn't happen. So I, I, mean, I wasn't surprised when I was writing the book. I figured that out a while ago. But I was surprised when I was a child the way my, my family talked about it. But I, there were lots of stories that I came about when I was researching that made their way into Gone with the Wind one way or another. There had been stories about, you know, ladies making dresses out of curtains and uh, killing the last chicken when their dad came home for Christmas and things like that where they stories that I found and I, I combined into, well, my story. And given that Scarlett O'Hara has become such a prominent figure, um, especially for, for strong-willed women, yeah. uh, could you see any of yourself in Scarlett? Or did someone else inspire her personality and fire? There's lots of people who think that I base Scarlett on me. There are also people who thought that I might have based Scarlett on my mother, who was also a very strong woman. And some other people think that, well, 
Oh, they're here and there, but Sky didn't base Skyline on anybody. If I put her in a little bits of me in there, I'm sure there are. I wrote her. And I'm sure there are bits of my mother. There's bits of my mother and me as well. But Scarlet's her own person. To say that Scarlet was somebody else would just be untrue to Scarlet. And in the novel itself, um, were other people, uh, did other people influence the other characters? And can you talk about um, the characters in your novel and, and any connections or what they represent? Mm. Well, lots of people think that Red, my first husband, is the basis for the character Red. And I'm not going to say that that's true or not true, but... There are some similarities. A good writer writes about what they know and their life experiences. So, of course, there's a lots of life experiences that of myself that made it into the book. Like, well, some of the things Red did and some of the things that, well, Red ended up doing in the book. And I think that, well, of course, there's nothing that's the same exactly that's a different time and different people but there, there's also the the death of Scarlet's mother and Scarlet doesn't make it to Tara in time and I think part of writing that for me was looking at my own experience of when I was trying to get home to my mother when she was sick and I didn't make it either so I don't think I I couldn't have Scarlet make it home because I hadn't made it home so that that part of my experience um, made its way into the book, and I think the way Scarlet survived and the way I've survived all the things that happened to me, well, we're survivors, and my family's a surviving family, and we we survive, and that's what the book's about. So. In your time as a reporter, it must have been very rare for there to be a female reporter. Yes. Were you shown any challenges to your position there? How, what was it like to be a female reporter for the Atlanta Journal? Yes, well, they always wanted me to do something not serious and write about society parties or something, but I wanted to do real journalism. So I went on the beat, and I went out, and I talked to prisoners on death row. I scaled a building and did all kinds of crazy stunts because I was in it for the thrills. I was in it for the reporting. I wanted to tell a story that mattered, and I think that's, again, with my novel, I wanted to tell a story that mattered, that something that people, that, some, that meant something to people. So... Of course, being a lady, being a southern lady out there, people were concerned about what I should and should not be doing. I paid them no mind, and I did what I wanted to and did what I thought was best. And I think I had a very good career as a journalist until my foot started acting up again and I couldn't do it no more. Now, if we have any uh, young girls that are watching that might be thinking about becoming a writer themselves, what do you have any advice for young writers, I guess boys or girls, out there? Yes, yes. Write. Just write all the time. Write little stories. Write in books. Write true stories. Write down stories you made up. Just write. Just right. Excellent. Well, Miss Mitchell, uh, you mentioned that there is possibly going to be a motion picture. Yes. So first, how do you feel about the, your book, which you never expected to become published, okay. becoming an actual moving picture? And uh, what do you hope people will uh, walk away from when they actually see it on a big screen? Well, I just hope they don't ruin it. I don't want to have much to do with it in case they do mess it up. That's going to be Mr. Selznick's problem and not mine. I want the book to say the book. And sometimes when they turn books into movies, they don't do it justice. And I am concerned that might, might be the case. They also are going to pay me a lot of money, which is fine by me. And therefore, whatever they want to do, they can. 
but I don't think I'm going to have much to do with it. I also, I don't, I don't like celebrities. I don't want to be a celebrity. I thought I did, and it was the worst thing that happened to me. So, I, I don't want to go to Hollywood. I don't want to be a movie star. I think I'm going to stay. I'm just going to stay in Georgia. And if Hollywood wants to come to me, well, maybe I'll go to the premiere or something, but I don't, I don't like going out in public much. It's everyone with the flashing cameras and calling your name and asking you questions. It's, it's too much. So I just, I think I will not be involved with it that much. Um, I hope that it's good. I would like to think that they did justice to my work. It is a really long book though, so I'm not sure how they're going to get all of those important details into the movie without it being too long. But we'll see what they come up with. I'm not a director and I have no plans to be. <laughs> Do you have any ambitions to write uh, more books after Gone with the Wind? Oh, I don't know. I, I write just to write, but how, how am I going to compete with myself? I, I don't know. Everyone wants to know what happened to Scarlet and Rhett, but I, I could write something about that. But it, the books are done. That that's the whole the whole point of it is you don't know. So I don't think I'm gonna write something there. I've been just trying to answer fan mail. Everyone keeps writing me, and I think I'll just I, if I keep answering everybody, I'm never gonna write another book. But we'll we'll see. I I won't say no. Well, Miss Mitchell, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us today. I, I wonder if we have any folks out there who have not read Gone with the Wind yet, hmm. what could you say to encourage them? What, what, why should they read this book? Oh, well, well, I thought it was pretty loud, so I don't think I'm a good salesperson, but everyone else seems to really like it and will stay up all night reading it, and I think it shows the spirit of Southern people that aren't gonna, well, admit defeat even when they should. And it inspires people to keep going and to, even though you're facing a lot of hardships that, well, tomorrow's another day and up to you to make it. A wonderful sentiment for us to conclude on. Thank you so much, Ms. Mitchell, and Absolutely. thank you so much to all of our members who joined us today. Bye now.